Um, tonight's speaker, Tor Hansen. Um, I'm so excited that you're here. He's so, you guys, if you haven't heard Tor speak, you're in for a treat. And I can never he hear you enough speak, Tor. He's <laughs> fantastic. Um, Tor is the author of two books, um, this one, Imperial Force, which Jenny has, and then his newest one, Feathers, which has received rave reviews. Um, and he'll be available for signing them after the talk, and the books are available through Jenny as well. Tor also has been instrumental in work with CDOC. He, we hired him this past year to write the Tufted Puffin Status Review. Um, Tor's writing skills, I think, is what got Department of Fish and Wildlife to say, wow, we're going to get this bird listed. Um, it was so well written. It was a pleasure to read. It was funny, which is unusual. And if you aren't <laughs> for a status review, um, so with the way it works, a status review works, if you aren't familiar with the process, in order for an animal or a bird to be listed, first you have to write a status review. And then it's reviewed um, by Department of Fish and Wildlife. Then, then it's eligible to be either listed as threatened or endangered. And then the work can be funded for its recovery. So one of the birds is the tufted puffin. And Tor did that for us. And thank you so much. So. Without any further ado, Tor, um, I would like to have you come up here and speak. So you guys, welcome, Tor. Thanks for coming. All right, are we live here on the microphones? Ah, excellent. Well, thank you, Jean and the Joes from the Sea Doc Society. And thank you to Laura from Camp Orkyla. And also, I want to reiterate, Thanks to Jenny for coming down from Darvels. And to remind you all to shop locally this holiday season because we owe a debt to our local independent bookstores for the ways that they enrich our community. So definitely shop local this holiday season. And of course, I want to extend my personal thanks to all of you for coming indoors this evening to spend, to devote an evening to feathers. This proves to me that you are all fellow followers of all things feather. <laughs> so I'm in, a, in good company tonight. Uh, but before we turn to the subject at hand, I do want to draw some attention to, I guess, an affinity that is shared by organizations like the Doc Society and Camp or Kyla, as well as people like myself who write about natural history. And just within the last year, and one of these uh, milestones came within the last month, our species... I'm sorry, I'm going to just take you off the mic, because something's wrong with that mic. Okay. It's cutting in and out. So, can you speak loud? I can speak loud. Can I still be heard? Yes. <laughs> Outstanding. So, our species, Homo sapiens, has passed two important milestones recently. The United Nations estimated that on Halloween, of this year, the seven billionth person was born. And that individual arrived on this planet at a, at a time where, for the first time in history, more than half of the human population lives in cities. We are becoming an urban species. And so this combination of milestones sets up a troubling dilemma in that we see the impacts of the human population reaching all-time highs at the very time that our familiarity and our daily interactions with the natural world are reaching all-time lows. So seen in that context, the work of organizations like CDOC or, or Kyla have never been more important. In the case of CDOC, it is uh, taking science off the shelf, putting it to work, and educating and informing the public as well as policymakers. And for Camp Orkyla, of course, it is getting our youth outdoors for educational and recreational opportunities based on nature. Both of these organizations share this fundamental affinity of enriching and enhancing our natural connections with the world outdoors, our natural and open and wonderful wild places. And of course, that is a goal 
of anyone who writes, as I do, about natural history. So I want to, to highlight and underscore those affinities and have us think as we move through our presentation tonight about those things and the importance of them as we see our population on this planet rising. So I am a conservation biologist by trade. And it is a wonderful career that has led me around the world, allowed me to study everything from primates to songbirds to plant communities in incredible locations from rainforests to prairies to our beautiful Pacific Northwest. Now, it is a job that combines careful field observations with laboratory work and no small amount of data analysis and technical writing. So for me to get to the book world, I had to travel through something of a back door. It is a route that, in my opinion, deserves far more traffic. It is, on a university campus, it's a, a dusty and dim, ill-used corridor that leads from the halls of science over to the English department. <laughs> Now, I am a firm believer in the importance of the storytelling of science. There are far too many important and intriguing discoveries and ideas that never make it beyond the relatively limited audience of peer review and scientific journals. Those are, of course, essential parts of science, but there are many, many instances where we need to take those stories farther. And particularly for someone like myself, who is interested in the conservation of the natural world, well, how on earth can we expect people to care about and protect things that we never even tell them about? So it's my belief in the storytelling of science that has led me to start writing books. And Feathers is my second book, and I feel like I'm starting to get my feet on the ground in the literary world, at least a little bit. My first real lesson came when the first book came out a few years back, and I happened to be oh, giving a paper at a scientific conference on the morning of the very same day I was giving a book reading in the evening. And if you will forgive me for expressing my results in terms of equations, this is what I learned. Scientific conference equals drafty meeting room, bullet points, stale Danish, bad coffee. Book reading, <laughs> bad coffee indeed. Book reading, on the other hand, equal cozy bookstore, cheerful book lovers, and in that case, wine and cheese. <laughs> you know, you really don't need the PhD to do those equations. <laughs> and I think by the time I'd finished my second cheese cube that evening, I decided I would write another book. <laughs> now, that's not to say that I have abandoned science and technical writing, not by any means. Of course, the Tufted Puffins uh, recently, but also some colleagues and I recently uh, finished an academic volume on a more weighty topic, uh, the ecological impacts of warfare. So those things continue, but I do hope and intend that writing for a broad audience will always be a vital part of what I do. Now, there is one area, at least one area, I should say, where I feel like I have quite a bit of room for creative development in the book world. And that has to do with the titles of books. Now, the first time around, I wrote a book about my experiences uh, studying mountain gorillas in a place called the Impenetrable Forest. And after careful consideration, I titled the book The Impenetrable Forest. And this time around, I've, I've written a book all about feathers. And I called it Feathers. <laughs> but at least, at least in the area of subtitles, I feel that I'm making real progress. Now, here we have Feathers, the Evolution of a Natural Miracle. Well, that not only has a little bit of literary tension to it. I mean, can a miracle actually evolve? It's kind of a puzzler. But it allows me to check off something rather important from my career to-do list. Because as you can imagine as a biologist and as a writer, it's pretty much 
part of the job description that you write a book with the word evolution somewhere in the title. So we can check that off, make progress in that department, but it could have turned out differently. Another thing that I've learned about the book world is that everything between the covers is the author's responsibility, and the author often comes up with the title, but the subtitle, now that is a bit of a group effort. And many ideas were thrown about for feathers, one of which, which nearly stuck, was this. Nature's greatest invention. If you ever want to start an argument, <laughs> just walk into a room and call something, anything, nature's greatest invention, and everyone will immediately leap to the defense of their own favorite evolutionary marvel. And whenever I find myself expounding on the wonders of feathers, someone will invariably say to me, yes, but what about the eyeball? <clears throat> How, how can a mere feather compare to the wonders of the human eye? To which I say yes, eyes are marvelous things for vision, but you wouldn't use them to decorate a hat. <laughs> you wouldn't stuff your pillow with eyeballs, nor would you strap them to your arms and try to fly. It turns out that there are many things in nature that, like eyes, are beautifully adapted to a single purpose. But almost nothing has adapted to so many purposes as feathers. Feathers insulate, glide, and flutter. They protect and beguile. They can be watertight or more absorbent than a dish sponge. They grow as thin as bristles, stiff as quills, or as downy and soft as the air. They can be as small as a pencil point or longer than a killer whale, as black as midnight, or as bright and iridescent as gemstones. Now, my fascination with feathers, and it is a fascination, dates back decades to, a, to an experience with African vultures that we will talk about in great detail in a few moments but also to my longstanding interest in watching birds in general. Because if you think about it, what is bird watching but feather watching? I mean, of course we know there's a scrap of meat in there holding the whole thing together. But when you look at a bird, what you see are its feathers. And while we also may become fascinated with bird behaviors, it's most often the beauty of their plumage that draws our eyes to the birds in the first place. So when I started this book, my knowledge of feathers came largely from my observations in the field, where time and again I had been amazed and astounded by the way birds use feathers for so many different uses, for flight, for insulation, for waterproofing, and of course for their incredible and colorful mating display. And on the off chance there are any doubters in the room about how amazing and colorful those displays can be, I have a, a short video to show you, 30 seconds or so, that makes the case better than anything that I could say. Uh, this scrap of, of video is on loan to me from a researcher in the Netherlands named Dirkele Stavenga, uh, but it was originally shot by a BBC film crew working in Papua New Guinea. This is uh, the mating dance of one of the birds of paradise, the uh, Laws' parotia. <clears throat> the one in the hula skirt is the male. <laughs> Females perched on the twig above. Now the finale. Uh -huh. 